Welcome to Old Path and our study through the Old Testament book of Psalms. We uh, make it to chapter 15 today, or Psalm 15. I do that a lot. <laughs> Not always calling it a psalm, but calling it a chapter. Um, we're going to get from uh, Psalm 15 up through 18. The first couple are, are actually pretty small in, in the actual number of verses. Um, the 18th is a pretty interesting one, and we'll, we'll explain why, or I'll explain why when we get there to it. But um, once again, in the Psalms, there is often the case, or it is often the case, that what exactly was going on is kind of left up for debate. And uh, sometimes just because of, I guess, what has been developed by tradition, some of it very old, um, there's speculation as to what David was going through. In one of the cases, chapter 18 or Psalm 18, we definitely know what was going on because um, what is said there is pretty much a verbatim repetition of what we see in 2 Samuel chapter 22. So I'll uh, discuss that when we get to it. But um, for where we are today, we pick up at uh, Psalm 15. And there are just so many things. Once again, at the, at the opening part of this, what we've come to so far is David. Um, the, the repeating themes that you'll see is him in his time of trouble and crying out to God and asking for God to take up his case in the face of his enemies. So that that's a very, very constant uh, kind of a problem that David seems to be, it's a reoccurring matter. And of course, his looking at God as God being just and that he will be the one who vindicates him, the one who will come to his assistance. Um, these are kind of repetitious things. And so uh, it's the, these times when he cries out for comfort, other times when he cries out and it's, it's to make known that God is, has done great things and come to his aid. This is that section in Psalms, or a section in Psalms, where they all seem to have a lot of that related together. Uh, Psalm 18 is one of the, the more lengthier uh, that we have encountered so far. And uh, what he ends up saying there comes at a time when he's seen some really amazing things. So um, we'll go ahead and, and take a look at that one as we close out today. But uh, we begin at, at uh, Psalm 15. So let's turn there and uh, let's have a word of prayer. It's only five verses long. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, Psalm 16 is only another 11. 18, like I say, is kind of lengthy. 17 is a little bit longer as well. And uh, I'm going to save getting to Psalm 19 because it's one of my favorites because of some of the things said in it. And it, uh, it, it has a, a familiar ring to what we read in Psalm 8. It's kind of that same thing. And uh, it is just the, the, the amazement as uh, David considers the, uh, the, the creation of God and how uh, taken he is by that. So uh, Psalm 15, let's have a word of prayer and let's take a look at what we see in the text. Father, we thank you for the time that we can spend looking into your word and we pray, God, that you would make known to us the, uh, the truths that are here. We pray, Father, that you would give us understanding hearts and minds, that by your spirit you would lead us and that we would make proper application to what we see, knowing that we look through the life of David, and it is important that we know that that is his, and the things that he says are, again, sometimes distant from our understanding because of a different covenant. But Lord, we pray that as we understand the history and why David would say such things, we want to pray that as we make application to what we read here, that we would rightfully divide your word, and that your, again, uh, your, your assistance to us by the work of the Holy Spirit that that would uh, come to fruit and that we would be changed by the things that we read. So we give you all thanks and praise and ask that you'd be glorified in Jesus' name. All right, so uh, Psalm 15 just says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle and who may dwell in your holy hill? It's a rhetorical question because he's going to go about answering it. And it is one of the things that as David asks it again, as I'd said, it's rhetorical. He's not looking for an answer. It's more, rather than a question, it's more of a statement. So who then would qualify? And it is a good thing to, be, to look at it as a question, but the good news is that David, as he sees it, is going to answer those things. Now, this is one of those Psalms. As we look through it, it's going to be evident and pretty much, I would say, obvious that what we look at in our lives, we would answer this question a bit differently. But remember, as David answers these questions, David knows that he is a king of a nation, and that nation is governed by the law of God, written out and codified some 500 years before David is even born. And that's when God takes the things 
that much of it, the more that we study, much of, of what we see in the law had to have already been in place, or at least they would know that this is what God had wanted, though we don't have the writings. Because they were doing many of the same kinds of offerings, uh, Abraham offering to Melchizedek. And so we see a number of the things mentioned as offerings, we see them mentioned before there is a Moses. And so, you know, th there's all kinds of speculation. Um, a lot of that stuff would have been maybe forgotten during their time in Egypt. Because you remember from the time that the children of Israel moved en, en masse to Egypt during the time uh, at the end of Jacob's life. And so certainly from the sons of Jacob, Joseph being there in Egypt, they were there in that captivity for 400 years. God also told Abraham of that 400 year captivity that it was going to be taking place. He does that in Genesis 15. And so... David is a man who is uh, now under the law that was given by Moses, and it was put in writing, this is what is expected of my people as they walk before me. This is what I will require of them to do. And so it was put in writing. It was codified, though, again, I believe much of it was there. The sacrifices, the reasons for them, that all seems to be, it's, it's you just see those things present before they were actually told to the children of Israel, you must do these things. So we're not going to spend a lot of time with that. But as David answers these questions, or answers the question with a, a series of answers, again, think about how different it would sound if we were giving these answers. So it says, who may abide in your tabernacle, your dwelling place? Now, David would more than likely be thinking about the place before the temple was built that was still that tabernacle, probably not the original one, but something that he had put together that could house the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant and those things where the, the, uh, uh, the, the corporate worship of the nation could take place. And the reason we say that is because the second part, who would dwell on your holy hill? So we think Zion, Mount Zion, uh, what would be above be, what would become known as the city of David up above it, where is now the Temple Mount, what's known as the Temple Mount. And so it's more the upper part of the of the place where the city of David and where the formal worship of Jerusalem would have been taking place, or in Jerusalem would have been taking place. So he asks that question. Who can abide in your tabernacle? Who can dwell in your holy hill? Who has access to you? Who can be close to you is really kind of the question that's being asked. So it says, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth to his heart. Great. That is something that would be a measure of a person who is obedient to the law. You'd be able to see those things. The uprightness that he's referring to, somebody that walks in a place of integrity and that's approved of God. God is accepting of them because they are obedient to what he has called them to do. So the one who walks uprightly, and there's no way for a person to walk uprightly unless God gives a standard for it. So in order to walk, it's that, uh, that idea of companionship that we have as we walk along with God. David speaking in those terms, a person who is going to be in a place of fidelity to the law of God because God has given instruction. So the one who works righteousness does those things that the law requires and speaks truth to his heart. He who does not backbite, that meaning slander, one who does not backbite with his tongue, nor evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach, or a, a, um, it's a way of, uh, of disparaging. It's a way of, uh, of, of leveling damage towards somebody in the verbal sense. Or it's a, you know, kind of disgrace them. Nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. Now, all of these things that you see here, as he says them in very generalized terms, if you were looking to do so, you could easily go back and find plenty of places in the Old Testament law where these are the things that you're supposed to do. You don't defame your neighbor. You don't slander them. You don't do those things towards them. So notice what he says. David says in the, in the very general sense, the one who walks uprightly, who does righteous things. And then gives a few examples of, of things that would be seen as unrighteous. Those that would slander, those that would disparage or, or disgrace their, their neighbor. These are things that the law spoke against. In whose eyes a vile person is despised, it means there's no admiration for them. When you despise something, it doesn't mean that you hate them, but you have no admiration for what they do. And who is the who are those people? The vile person, the one who's, who does wickedness, kind of opposed to the people who do all the things that he has already des described. So 
there is the personal part of the things that they are supposed to do, but when they are exposed to those things that they should not do and seeing people participating in those, there is a revulsion in them. That's what the picture that's being framed here for us. It says, um, verse 4, in whose eyes the vile person is despised, or there's no admiration for them, but, or by contrast, he honors those who fear the Lord. Those people who fear the Lord are the ones that are already spoken of in the earlier verses that we've looked at here. Those who are responsive to God have done what he has required of them. They are people who are, are faithful to the law and they keep God's word. Of course, they're like us now. They're not perfect in this. There are plenty of places that we would see as maybe considering their faults, just like the rest of us. There's no question about that. But in this case here, he's just talking about people who are kind of separate from those who would do, as he says, the vile people. So it says, uh, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. So they, they vow to do something or they say that they will do something, even if it is of cost to them. And perhaps that cost is realized as being greater after the fact, but yet they hold to that pledge. They hold to their word, their people of integrity, no matter the personal cost. So <clears throat> it says, he who does, who does not put his uh, put out his money to usury or charge uh, interest, totally against the, the law of God. They were never supposed to do that. So this is a person who would put out money to somebody's need, but never request any kind of interest in the, in the return. Nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Somebody approaches them, I need you to say that this person did that or the other thing, because they have an ulterior motive. And if you say this, there'll be something in it for you. So that would be a problem of lying. But that lie would come at the expense of someone who is innocent because of an accusation made by somebody who's kind of fitting that category of vile. None of this is really hard for us to understand. And really, frankly, as we read through it, it's like, yeah, this all makes sense. And so for those people who would say, well, we're not under the law anymore. I would have you read a verse like this and say, even if you're doing it in accordance, in accordance with what the law would specify, how could you possibly find fault with this? It's one of those really great passages because it is it really goes to the heart of the integrity of the individual. And are you willing to do things as God would require them of you? Because they're really kind of against man's nature, if you haven't noticed here. So it says, um, again, verse 5, Nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be moved. They cannot be shaken. They cannot be taken out of their position. And of course, that means rightly before God. So really, who is the person who would move them in the first place? Who is the person who would, would look to them and approve or disapprove of them? And of course, the, the answer is obvious. It's God who approves or disapproves of any of these things. The promise that David makes here is the person who does walk in this place of integrity will be pleasing to the Lord and the Lord will repay accordingly and, and see to the person's need accordingly. So, uh, Psalm 16. It says, preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. And so the preserving is see to my need and, and sustain me. Now, no one lives forever in these bodies. It's just at the time, though, uh, for some unnatural cause, because of the people who look to, to um, undo him or people who have looked to kill him, until it's that, this is a better way of phrasing it. Until the time comes, Lord, when you call me to yourself or when this life is over for David, in the meantime, preserve me because otherwise, if people had their, their way about it, he would have been removed a long time ago. He says in here, for I put my trust in you. I, I look to you for the preserving, though there are plenty who would want me gone because ultimately I trust in you. That's what's being spoken of here. And he says, oh, my soul. You have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. What a great statement. This is something we should be able to make application for ourselves. There is nothing apart from what God does that is of any usefulness at whatsoever. Um, when I think of what uh, John says, it's 1 John um, chapter 4, I believe. It says that we love him because he first loved us. So let's remember it's God who initiates all of these things, and we are the respondent. So not only because he's eternal in that, in that sense, but because everything that we could point to where we could say we are right before God is because he's provided the means by which that could take place. We can have fellowship with him because our sin has been forgiven in Jesus. 
But more importantly, he's taken the time to write those things down that we would know how to walk in a place of integrity. So anything that we would present before the Lord, and I don't care what it is, anything that we could point to and say, Lord, here's what I offer to you, or here's what I've done on your behalf, here's what I've done for the church or for this person or whatever else it may be, making application to us, we would have to realize that apart from him, we can't do those things. And Jesus even said that, without me, you can do nothing. And so the recognition of that, it's, it's really a, a very comforting thing. And the reference for that is uh, John 15, the vine and branches passage, where Jesus says, without me, you're, you're incapable of doing anything. It's in the first, well, I think, five or six verses he gets to that part. But the important aspect of this, we wouldn't know what to do that could be pleasing to the Lord unless he had taken the time to make it known to us to have it written out, and then in our obedience to those things, the work of the Holy Spirit is to approve of those things and let us know that what we are doing is pleasing to him. So with all that as the background, then David is able to say, my goodness, the things that I could do to point to and say he's a good person would be able to say, well, I have no possibility, there's no possible way I could claim anything that is good if he was not first the author of that goodness. That's a very important thing for us as David to recognize. Now notice this. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom um, uh, is all of my delight. Now that's in quotations in the New King James and in other translations. And it's brought up the question, is this God speaking through David, that it's God who delights or is it David who delights? And you can make the case for either, so it's really not a big issue. But these ones that are on the earth, these these ones that are mentioned, these saints that are on the earth, these excellent ones, are those who walk by faith in God based upon what he has given to them in their instruction, their, their, uh, their marching orders, if you will. And we're talking about the law here. Those things written out and specified for them to do and to walk in that place of integrity. So those are the ones being referred to. And then verse 4 Uh, Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. And this is by the contrast. The excellent ones as opposed to these. Their sorrows will be multiplied who hasten after other gods. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, David speaking for himself, nor will I take up the names on my lips, the, the names of the gods or even the people who may be doing these things. More than likely, he's referring to the gods that these people serve. Now, this this drink offering of blood is, is something that's really, it's an unusual phrasing. We know about drink offerings. They're before the law and they're, they're prescribed in, in detail in the actual law itself of the different types of sacrifices and what's supposed to be offered, but it's the pouring out of things. So is this actually that there was a literal pouring out of blood because blood was was in the cup? And that is one of the possibilities. And and is there some kind of an offering that was being made of blood in this cup that was being an offering, if you will, poured out in some way? Or is it the drink offerings like we would think of some kind of a liquid, something of, uh, you know, a wine or an oil or something that they would have that they would pour out, but because of the ritual involved with it involving blood of sacrifice to, to David, it would be a bloody sacrifice and not something with which he would, uh, um, something that he would want to uh, identify himself. It's, it's completely contrary. It's a different offering because it's two different gods. So again, is it about sacrifice and is it about catching the blood in, a, in some kind of a cup and then pouring it out? That's Some speculate that it's being that literal or it's more in the sense that there are people who have the same ritual, but based on the ritual that they have standing in stark contrast to what's in the law, the pouring out of the offering to God is holy and it's right and it's acceptable. If it's to another God, it is of blood because it has a libel to it. It has, uh, it, at minimum, at minimum, it is idolatry. At worst, it could involve sacrifice and sacrificing to other gods. So David goes on. He says, "Oh Lord, you are uh, the portion of my inheritance and of my cup, and you maintain my lot. You oversee all the things, my lot, the things given to me, and ultimately." This portion and inheritance is that David has been given the position as king. He's part of the uh, the tribe of Judah. It's God who has overseen and put all of these things in place and, and has set him in the in the, the place where he is. So 
really important to catch that David sees this and is is just right up front saying all this, recognizing that as great as he is with his prominence and position, all of those things are only there because God has put them there. And so again, the recognition that no matter who we are and how prominent we may be, ultimately we are nothing more than what God has made us. Great reminder for each of us. So he says in verse 6, the lines have fallen to me in uh, pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance going on with what he has just said. And these lines are, are kind of what would be put down so that it would delineate the, the territories that belong to a particular person, their, their allotment of land. David uses that imagery of saying the, the things that you have given to me as an inheritance, not speaking of land per se, but of the position that he's put him in. Because remember, David's residence is in Jerusalem. A, a, a temple has, not a temple, but a, a house has been built for him in the, on the actual mountain of God in Zion. And so David doesn't have that allotment for sheep and goats out somewhere in the, in, in the area outside of Jerusalem. It's more of a way of recognizing this is what you have given to me. This is my inheritance. These lines, you've drawn it out. You've, you've put the section there for me. It says, now I have set the Lord always before me. That's the recognition. I, I'm, he's always on my mind. He's always before me. I'm always considering him. He is before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. That proximity that he has to God and God to him, there's no reason for him to be fearful if God is there with him and he is there at God's right, right hand or vice versa. That there is that proximity, that relationship that he has with God. Therefore, he cannot be moved. So it says, therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh will rest in hope. Now, before we get to the rest of it, this verse 9, his heart is glad and his glory rejoices. And the, the rejoicing of glory is that everything that I am, everything that that, uh, that I could um look at as, as a glorious, as a, a reason for excitement or even boasting is sometimes used in this. It's just, it's a way of rejoicing. Everything that I could say about God, what he has done in me, it's a cause for rejoicing. And the second part of that, my flesh will also rest in hope. I will, I will cease from concern because there is that expectation and the anticipation of what God will do. He's the one who is for me. So David is just saying, in a series of different ways. As he looks at his life, it's not pointless. It's, it's not without direction. There is a point to everything, and the direction is ultimately given by God, who has selected him, has made him king, given him this inheritance that he is talking about. So what does that do to settle his heart? I can be in a place of safety and security in my own heart and mind, and I can be in that expectation, or that hopefulness that everything is going to work as God has, has put it out. And he ends the chapter by saying something really profound. And, and we'll read it here in verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, and that being the grave, or some refer to it as the underworld, and not in the, the, uh, not in the, the occultic sense. But when a person dies, sometimes uh, Sheol is referred to as the grave, but it really is the, I've heard it, uh, a way that it said is the abode of the dead. Now, what would happen to a person after they died at David's time? As we understand from what Jesus talks about, the bosom of Abraham, where you, you had the rich man and Lazarus, where he tells that, doesn't it's not a parable. He's telling something about a, a place that actually exists. And why would something like that exist? Why does such a place, why does such a place exist? Because judgment is deferred for a later time. The final judgment of all of mankind really culminates at chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. So that's when we know that those who had died in rejection of God will have to stand before him, have their lives examined, see that they are not in the book of life. That's already a known thing, but it is a way for the accountability person by person to stand before God as judge for their rejection. So think of it this way. Any person that has died for the history of mankind has gone to a place of, of waiting that judgment, and they are there to this day. They will not be taken from that place until they stand before God as judge. But when we think of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man that Jesus is talking about would still be in that place today, awaiting the events that are spoken of in 
chapter 20 of Revelation, the great white throne, when all of those who had died will be judged and they will experience at that point a second death. And they will be separated from God, cast into the lake of fire. That's what chapter 20 says. But what of the rest of these people? That's not David has, doesn't have to look for that. He's already going to be in a place of recovery. He's been taken from that place. Here he says, you will not leave me in Sheol. Now, why would he have to be there in the first place? He was pleasing to God, not perfect, but he was pleasing to God. Well, how is he different from anybody else that we know who walked rightly before God? So um, you have, at that point, you have um, Enoch says that he walked before God and he was taken. You know, didn't see physical death, but he still couldn't have been in the presence of God. He would have been with David and Sheol. So everybody from, from Adam all the way up to the time of David, the faithful who had been faithful to God had to go into Sheol, this place of waiting, until they could be taken out of that place. Now, what, what occurred that made that possible that they could, be, that they could leave that place? Simply put, as we studied the scripture, uh, an offering was finally made for them that would satisfy the requirements of, in David's case, the law. But how could God purge the sin of mankind from their account? They're sinners. They have, they have done things that keeps God from um, indwelling them and having direct fellowship with them. That's because of their sin. Nothing had, had been done to take care of their problem of sin. In the person of Jesus, you now have remedy. He has now offered himself as a perfect sacrifice, acceptable to God. And as a result of that, man can have his, his slate, if you will, wiped clean and be made right before God and dwelt by the Spirit in our current time. But to David, once that sacrifice was made, Jesus could set him free. And uh, the book of Ephesians alludes to this, that he descended to into the, the parts, Sheol, this place, the, the abode or the, the underworld, whatever people want to call it. He went to these, this place where these people were being held and said, I'm here to deliver you out of this place. So when David says this, I've always just thought this is kind of cool. When David wrote this, you will not leave my soul in that place of Sheol. There will not be a disconnect and a separation. You won't leave me in that condition. When Jesus came to set him free from that and anybody else who was there awaiting that, that rescue, David would have been able to say, this is what I've been waiting for. I knew this day was coming because the Lord showed it to him here in Psalm 16 as he, as he pens this and puts it in verse 10. Of course, he didn't call it verse 10. It was just a, a one long statement, not with chapter and verse. That's for our benefit. So, you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now, this seems prophetic. David, whatever he may know about him, the Holy One is not David here. You'll notice that it's capsed. And that's because it is the belief that even Jesus himself, the Redeemer, and David may have written this not fully even understanding what he was saying, but the idea that even Jesus would taste of death, but he never saw corruption. So that means that he, you know, he didn't, his body didn't decay. He didn't become bones. We know that he was buried, but he resurrected before that, you know, on that third day, he rose again. So there was no corruption. And so he resurrected and came back to life. Uh, life was restored to the body. And so the idea that he wouldn't see corruption, he wouldn't be in the, sa the, the same place where David was. So David's body died and was made into bones. But he, as far as his soul was concerned, stayed in that place waiting for Jesus. The one who would not see any kind of corruption brought him. And it says, In your presence is the fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And that just means these are things that are pleasant. These are things that are sweet. So pleasures forevermore is dealing with delight. Being where God is, is a joyous thing. It's sweet. It is comforting. It is, pick your words. At your right hand is everything that this world cannot offer because God offers something greater than this world. And so David is able to say that as his last statement. Now, Psalm 17 says, Hear a just cause, O Lord, and attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Just again, a statement of, of what he sees as fact. Now again, this is, it's not arrogance and it's not boastful. Because um, we're, we're, we're reading these things maybe through a, 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 a a prism of what the, the scriptures teach us about our days. Because 
to the believer, when we realize what makes us right before God and how can we be acceptable to him, the first thing that comes to our mind is Jesus because of what he has done, and he accomplished that 2,000 years ago. So the last thing that we would do would be to come before the Lord and say, look at what I've done, look at what I've accomplished, look at, look at my pious life, look at my, my works, look at my goodness, those kind of things. It would never occur to us to say that, because ultimately we would say, I wouldn't be capable of any of those things, and if Jesus had not died in my place, I would be shut off to these things and incapable of any of it. So if we look at anything in our lives in a New Testament sense and say, this is good and it's useful and it's wonderful and it brings God glory, remember he was the author of it in the first place. And without him, we wouldn't even have the awareness to do such things. So it would be a different thing for us than for David because David, again, he's faithful to what the law says. And he wants that to be known and he wants that to be said and acknowledged before God. Not because of pride or arrogance, because he, he would know how poor that would work because God doesn't like pride and arrogance. But it would be something in David's life to be able to say, I've honored your word and here is the acknowledgement of those things. And it's a way of David saying, I, I've been obedient to you. So it's not David being a, a braggart. It's not him glorying in his own abilities or anything else, but rather an acknowledgement, Lord, look at what you have done through my life. And, and it's an acknowledgement of those things. That's the way that this is being presented because again that's David's understanding that's what he knows so let my vindication come from your presence let your eyes look on the things that are upright and the idea of vindication and I every time I read this and passages like it I remember a time and I you know I don't tell stories often but there was a time way back when uh, when I was at Cyprus long before I had become the senior pastor and uh, just when I was one of the board members there, and we went through a, a lot of very difficult things, and I heard some things said about my pastor that were so untrue and, and really uncharitable, just wrong and, and incorrect. And I wanted so much for him to address those things over the pulpit, to say, you know, there are things that are said that were, frankly, some of it was just totally slanderous towards him, and I was offended for him. He was my, he was my brother in the Lord and a man that I respected and loved. And I just didn't think that it was right that those things would be said. And he he didn't quote this, I don't think, but he, he quoted one of the passages or even the principle where you find it in many places. It's God who vindicates me. I cannot vindicate myself. I have to rely upon the Lord to do that. Let people say what they're going to say. When it all comes down and everything sees, when, it's, when the dust settles, God will have vindicated me. I cannot vindicate myself. And I've never forgotten that. And if I do the math in my head, we're probably talking coming up on 30 years ago, I heard him say that. So that's pretty amazing. It, it just left such an impression on me because I was so so taken by it at the time, though I still want him to do it. Vindicate yourself. He said, this is it. Let my vindication come from your presence. You be the one who vindicates me. Let my eyes look upon the things that are upright. So... Whatever it was that was coming against him, once again, we don't have the details, but he says, I can do one of two things. I can look to try to defend or vindicate myself, try to make myself innocent, or I can allow God to be the one who does that on my behalf. There's your options. So he says in verse three, you have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. And that's the way God speaking in dreams to him and, and how he, things are made aware to him. You have tried me. And you have found nothing. I have, pur I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. What a wonderful thing to say. You've tried me. You've found nothing. But I have purposed that, I, um, that my mouth shall not transgress. I won't say and do things that would be sin, if, if you will. Now, again, for all of David's faults, we can look at the things that he has done. And he'll say it here. There, yet I never led the nation into a place of rebellion against God. And so he didn't have any personal rebellion in him against God's ordinances, the things that God had required. His time of rebelliousness was a momentary thing because his passions got in the way. And he was a man who was given to such things. But as far as like deliberately sitting down, I'm going to get into the idolatrous things and I'll lead the nation in that way. Many kings did exactly that, whether they, they worked through it in their minds that way. The end result was the same. 
their own wickedness and infidelity towards God became something that the nation saw and ended up following because they were doing those things. You can never make that case against David. David never brought himself or the nation into a place of rebellion against God in the spiritual sense. And that's what sets him apart from most of the kings to some extent or another. So he says in verse 4, Concerning the works of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer. Uphold my steps in your paths, that my footsteps may not slip. And so he that dependency on God. When I compare what you ask of me, watching what the other people do, I don't do in kind. So this is, again, that idea of vindication. Search me out. See the things that I've done. David is sure of his position, but it is also to say, as you examine me, Lord, you'll see that this is a matter of integrity. So he says, I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. So incline your ear to me and hear my speech. This is a really good passage for us to remember in making application here. The idea that God, uh, there's a few operational things. Because God has asked us to do it, we are able to say this. I know that there is something that I can bring before the Lord. I know that he is able to hear and he is able to answer and he is able to do things that I cannot do for myself and no other source can. So all of those things have to be understood. God wants to hear from me. God will hear from me. God can answer in a way that I expect, and he will definitely answer somehow, some way, in ways that I may not expect, but answer he will, and he is able to do all those things. The one thing that you don't have in this at times is the timing of it all. When will these things take place? Those are questions that can only be answered when they come to pass. So we can't get out ahead of him. Verse 7, show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand, O you, save, o, uh, o you who save those who trust in you from those uh, who rise up against them. Uh, keep me as the apple of your eye and hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me and from the deadly enemies who surround me. So really amazing. Where you just These are things that we know. Verse 7, show your marvelous loving kindness uh, and your right hand that you would save those who trust in you. David understands this, and that is the idea of saving and preserving. And there is the salvation in the spiritual sense. But when you read that, I'm sure that you're probably thinking in the New Testament sense, we understand the idea that, that salvation is not even a question to the believer. Salvation is already realized, and we'll know the fullness of that when we leave these bodies in this life and go on to what he's preserved for us. But here and now, sorry, here and now, we understand what salvation looks like. It's something that we, we live in. We have it. So that's where he says, So then show your loving kindness and your right hand, O that you save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. So he is speaking about the salvation or the saving from the enemies that are coming against him in the physical sense. And again, making spiritual application, there's also the, the, the one enemy that we all face from the beginning of time, and that is the enemy, the one who is the enemy of our soul, the one who looks to, to uh, damage us, and keep us from God who is able to save us in the eternal sense. So really interesting how you can see the application of both parts. David understood both very, very well. There were people who wanted to take his life constantly. And there's also the idea that he would realize that God was also his redeemer, the one who would not leave him in Sheol, as we see there. So that's where he says, keep me as the apple of your eye. And that's a interesting phrase. What really the apple is just meaning the the, the center or the middle of the eye. So the apple is like the round the round part. It's, it's pretty much that's the technical description of the apple. When you look at it, it's, it's the center. And you can find it used in the Hebrew in a number of places where it doesn't even seem to give the same impression as apple. But this is David asking, God, would you keep me at the center of these things? Not in the way of, of you know, his own narcissism. It's not that kind of a thing. It's rather... I don't want to be outside of your view, so keep me in the center of your view, and that's to watch over me. And it's not because I want to have some special uh, privilege above everyone else. I'm sure David would say, for all those who trust in you, may we all be in the center. May we all be at the middle or the apple of your eye, right in the middle of it. And it's the way of him just acknowledging, as you look out over mankind, may I be right in the middle of those things. Because David also sees it, that's a if he's doing those things and that's his place of, 
of fellowship with God, he'll be doing those things and producing what is right. Otherwise, God would tell him, you're, you're, not, you're not where you're supposed to be. And he would correct him. So, verse um, 9, from the wicked who oppress me and from the deadly enemies who surround me. So that's the hide me in the shadow of your wings. That keep me in that place in the center. Watch over me is his way of putting it from those people who would want to do him harm. Verse 10, they have closed up their uh, their fat hearts, and that's just a way of the indulgence, their their own, uh, th they look to their own ability and their own way to sustain themselves. They've fattened themselves to that point. And so with their mouths, they speak proudly. So that's the evidence of the fatness of their heart. Their own self-assurance and their own pride has brought them to that place. They have, uh, <clears throat> they have now surrounded us uh, in our steps, and they have set their eyes crouching down to the earth as a lion is eager to tear his prey and like a young lion lurking in secret places. So arise, O Lord, confront them, cast them down, deliver my life from the wicked with your word, so, or with your sword, rather. Um, his recognition, whoever the enemies are, this is him, as he is always doing, coming to the Lord and say, you be the one who comes to my defense. You be the one. Remember, he started this this uh, this psalm with the one who vindicates him. You're the one who is my vindication. And so um, verse 2 is where he says that, let my vindication come from your presence. That's what he's asking for at this point. And then so he gets to verse 14, with your hand from men, O Lord, from men of the world who have uh, their portion in this life and whose belly you fill with your hidden treasure. They are satisfied with children and leave the rest of their possessions to their babies. But as for me, I will see your face in righteousness, and I will not be satisfied until, or I shall be satisfied when, I awaken your likeness. So this is David saying, there are those people who put all of their trust in the things of this earth. I will never be satisfied with such things. I will only be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. So that would be an eternal sense. That's a way of him just distinguishing himself from those people who live for the here and now, and this is the best that it's ever going to be for them. And David says, I can't find satisfaction, even as a king with all of his privileges. I can't find satisfaction in those things. I will not find satisfaction until I awaken your likeness. So as you read these things, what I hope that you're able to do is to say, I'm, I'm where he is in heart and in mind, but what it takes to get there from what he understood versus what we understand looks so different. Because again, to him, it's doing those things that are in the law and being pleasing to the Lord because of his obedience to what God has written. To us, it is, I want to be right before the Lord and I want to accept the provision that he has made for me in the person of Jesus who has saved my soul. And we find great comfort and peace in that, realizing that that's what he has provided. We have not provided it for ourselves. So really cool stuff. Now, chapter 18, or, or uh, Psalm 18, begins this way. I will, uh, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. That's how this psalm begins. The rest of what you see here is taken from um, 2 Samuel chapter 22. Let's turn there real quick, because it, it helps us to kind of get a, a, an understanding of where where this is in time. And this is one of those places that I had said before, we can know what was going on and what was happening in David's mind because the exact same words are taken from what we read here in uh, 2 Samuel 22. And what we'll do is we'll look just up the passage uh, ever so slightly to what came in chapter 21 as the most recent part of it. So look at what, what it says here in verse 15 of uh, 2 Samuel 21. When the Philistines were at war with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and they fought against the Philistines and, um, and David uh, grew faint. Then Abish, uh, Ashby, rather, Ashby Benob, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, uh, who was bearing a new sword, uh, thought that he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. 
Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp, uh, the lamp of Israel. If you die, the lamp of Israel, what, what gives us our, our strength and our, our hope and our king, if you're dead, look at what that would do to the nation. And you can read the rest of this. And so God gives them this incredible, um, these incredible victories, one over another, from these really interesting characters that we see, these sons of the giant, and there's nowhere near the time to go into that. But this gives you the understanding of what we read in, uh, in Psalm 18. Where, is, where does this come from, and what was the occasion of this? And so we, we read that, but then when you get to verse uh, or chapter 22 of 2 Samuel, you read this. When David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord had delivered him from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So when you read this psalm and you, you get the, the wording here, you'll already know that, that what David is saying in the psalms comes directly from this, and we know what it's in response to because that's what's given to us in verse 1. The, the defeating of the Philistines that we just started to read there, but also the, the fact that he and his life had overcome Saul who wanted him dead as well, and God delivered him at that time. So then David is able to say, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. Now let's look at Psalms, because we read that first part. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. And then look at the next word. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. So if you compare this side by side with what we just read at, at uh, Samuel, that song that was being sung at the time is repeated for us here in this psalm. So let's look at the content of it, because it's really terrific. The Lord is my rock, and, um, and he is my fortress, my deliverer. So this is the, the idea of being foundational, that no matter what comes against me because of this firm foundation, there's nothing that can come against him. Because, of, he, because he leaned on the Lord, of course his, him and the nation would have victory over the Philistines. Of course he, on a personal level, would be sustained and brought to the place of being the king, even though the king before him wanted him dead over and over again. And he, you know, ups and downs. Saul, why did I try to kill you, David? I'm so sorry. And then he looks to kill him again. It's just the craziness and the, the insanity of Saul. David looks back at that and says, the Philistines want to be gone. Saul want to be gone. I'm still here. They're gone. So David recognizes that. So it's the Lord who is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. That verse 3 is a song that we used to sing way back in the day around Calvary Chapel, and the guys and the girls had their part, but it was just that passage right there, verse 3. So once again, David looks at that and says, I not only have survived, but I have triumphed over the Philistines. I have not only survived Saul's death threats, but he's now gone and God has preserved me. So it's his way of, of recognizing that, God, you're the one who has done all of these things. Everything from being the place where he could hide and take shelter to the one who would go and fight before him or on his behalf. He looks to the Lord and says, you're the one who has made all of these things possible. So verse 4. The pangs of death, they surround me, and the, the pangs would be like the territory or the boundaries. The pangs of death, they surround me, and uh, the, the death is really the absence of life. There's just, I am lifeless. So what, what death wants to do is kind of draw a border around me, and it says that it's surrounded me. It's, they've encompassed. I'm completely surrounded by these things. And it says, and the floods of ungodliness, they have made me afraid. And the ungodliness is those people who are the worthless ones, the ones who have looked to do him harm. So when he says this, the floods is that torrent of water kind of narrowed down into a rush of water. So he sees the wickedness of people and the flood that that is as they kind of come against him, that deluge, um, says that they have made him afraid, uh, the... Um, they have made him afraid, and that's the, I, I'm in this place of terror and fear. They have made me, but you'll see what happens when he says all of these things. This is what has been happening to me from the beginning. That, that death has looked to draw borders around me and entrap me, and the, the flood of wickedness and those people who practice those things have come at me and looked to, to deluge or to drown me. 
and then he says the sorrows of Sheol, um, the uh, sorrows of Sheol, uh, they surround me and the snares of death have confronted me. And this is, this is all very similar wording. So there is the idea of Sheol or that place of the underworld. There's actual death itself. But it's as though these things are all coming at him at the exact same time. And he sees those. The sorrows of Sheol. And, uh, of course, sorrows are, are kind of, um, it, it's the same word that's used for pangs. It's the, the drawing of a border around him. So the sorrows of Sheol, they surround me. And the snares of death, they um, confront me. In my distress, when all that's going on, in my distress, however he could say, I called upon the name of the Lord, and I cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him even to his ears. So when we read those kind of things, look back at this. That would be a way of saying, what are these sorrows? What are the pangs? What are the, you know, the, his fear of death, his fear of, of going into the grave? Where, what's the source of that? We know that from 2 Samuel 22. The Philistines, Saul, over and over again, those who looked to put him out and came against him. Who are these wicked people? Who are the worthless ones? The Philistines, the people like Saul, those who would look to do him harm. He sees those people as coming against him all the time, and yet God is the one who came to, his, his, to answer his cry. Notice what David does here, too, because it's super important. When these things start to happen, he doesn't look to deal with it by himself. Instead, as those things come towards him, and he had to do this, of course, constantly, because it's always something new with him. It's always some other group. It's always some other people looking to do him harm. So what he ends up doing is he cries out to the Lord every time. So this is what he does. So he says, at that time, um, in distress, I called upon the Lord, cried out to my God, and he heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him even to his ears. That's a, a wonderful way of just saying he was not indifferent towards these things. He heard and he answered, of course, and here's how we know he answered. Then the earth shook and it trembled. The foundations of the uh, hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Now, is there any one particular place where you can look at it and find that being identical? Or is it his way of just saying, over and over again, God moved, if you will, heaven and earth, using some kind of a phrasing of just saying, the supernatural took place. That people were able to tell that God's anger had been aroused on behalf of David, and God took that case, or his cause, David's cause, and he intervened in these matters. That's what's being spoken of here. So... Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it, uh, and he bowed the heavens. Also he came down with darkness under his feet, and he rode upon the cherub, and he flew, and he flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him... From brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. And this is, again, he's using all kinds of imagery in a way of trying to present that when God took up his cause, though it may not have looked like this in the literal sense, when his enemies were defeated so often, it was like, how did that possibly happen? It was clear that something supernatural had taken place. And let's be honest, there were times in, in their history, not necessarily as David's, where you did have like hailstones coming down and just really amazing things. But there's no way that you could come to any conclusion other than this. God heard what David had said. God, please vindicate me. Please come to my assistance. Help me. Deliver me. All those things he said over and over again that God was going to make good on that, but it wouldn't be subtle. And this is David's way of saying what God did was not subtle. And so he uses this imagery. If you want to know, if, if you were to say, David, can you describe for me as you see it, how God did what he did? David would be able to say, well, I can tell you this. When God got to, decided to get involved, man, it was like everybody knew what was going on. It was as though hailstones. It was as though the sky was dark and it was all that stuff because it was so obvious that he had done it, you couldn't write it up to any way or explain it any other way than God got directly involved in the process. That's what David wants to get across here. The people could see the imagery of it. So he goes on and he says, um, where did we leave off? 
um, verse 14. So he sent out his, um, his arrows and uh, scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and uh, he vanquished them. And so again, Philistines, Saul, those people that are mentioned in 2 Samuel. Then the channels of the sea were seen, the foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. That's when it all took place. You came to my defense and you did these things on my behalf. So it says, now he sent from above and he took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were uh, for they were too strong for me. David is recognizing this is because of my military prowess. When God, you delivered me from these people, they were greater than I. So this is David kind of humbly saying, I'm the one that you've chosen. He recognizes that and he's willing to say it. And yet there's no way I could have done this without you. And this is David really acknowledging the supernatural way that God came to his defense and who sustained him when there's no other way that this could have happened. So he's able to say, they confronted me in the day of calamity, and um, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me into the broad place and he delivered me because he delights in me. And that's, you know, th there's no reason for us not to acknowledge that. It's not to boast or anything else, but for the believer, we should never take it any further than this, but we should at least be able to say, we're his kids. The Bible refers to us as his children. And the idea that he would delight in his children, the ones who would do as he has asked them to do, who walk with him in a place of integrity, not perfect, but still nonetheless, when God looks at us, he doesn't look at us for our perfection. He just looks and says, these are my children. These are the ones who have been born to me, and it's because of the work of Jesus. And we would just look at that as David would, that God was the one who brought him to that place. It's not a boast. It's just a statement of fact. So same thing when somebody would, I've said this many, many times, especially in California, when people would ask, you know, how do you know that you're going to heaven? Or are you going to heaven? You're able, better to say it that way. Are you going to heaven to be able to say with total, absolute, 100% assurance, I absolutely know that I'm going to heaven. And it's not because of anything that I've done, because it's a promise that's based upon what God had said he would do. To those who would put their trust in Jesus and be cleansed from their sin, their destination is heaven. Their destination is to be with him. And ultimately, heaven becomes a terrestrial thing. The new heaven and the new earth come down here. As we would think, it, it looks nothing like what we have currently, but it's not just hanging around on some clouds like angels with harps, that nonsense that we get you know, from pictures and, and the oversimplistic, silly things that we see uh, in pictures. God creates a new heaven and a new earth, and it's a terrestrial thing. It's not just somewhere out there in the darkness floating around. It's not that kind of a thing at all. So David says this, The Lord rewarded me according to his righteousness. And this is really interesting when you stop to think about this. Because once again, we never say, God's re who is, well, let's look at verse 20. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. The Christian would say, I have been rewarded because of the righteousness of Jesus, and I wear it as a cloak. I clothe myself with the righteousness of Jesus. Revelation 19, the church, when it comes back with him, is clothed in, in white robes, garments, that are the righteousness of him. He's the one who has clothed us with those things. Now, according to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. No Christian could say this. David could, because ultimately he could look back and say at the end of his life or at any particular time, I'm faithful to what God has asked me to do. No one is perfect, but when you look at his life, he concerns himself with being obedient to the word of God. He's a man of the law and doing what God has asked him to do according to that law. So how David would say these things looks so different from the church. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and I have not wickedly departed from him. And I, I mentioned earlier, that's what sets him apart from so many of the, of the uh, kings, that he never had that place of spiritually leading himself or anyone else astray concerning the Lord. He did the things best. Sheba is a great example of that. He became a man who was just overwhelmed by his passions and lust. And it, it brought him to a place of failure and sin with horrible consequence. But it wasn't because he had 
decided to go after other gods and begin that, that matter of idolatry. That was never his problem. Now, for all of his judgments were before me. I kept them before me. I recognized what he has asked of me. And I did not put away his statutes from me. I was always blameless before him, and I kept myself from iniquity. That blamelessness does not mean sinlessness, but it means that when sin would enter in, he would do what the law prescribed and make himself right before God by offerings, sacrifices. Therefore, when somebody looked at him, they wouldn't be able to say, hey, in your failure, you didn't do this to make yourself right before the Lord. David would say, I know what I did as far as sin. I've acknowledged it. I've brought it before the Lord, and I've sought him for his forgiveness. I've, I've made my sacrifice. I've done what I've, I'm supposed to do to be restored. So fast forward into a New Testament sense. When sin enters in, the only thing that we can do is take that before the Lord and acknowledge it, seek him for his cleansing and forgiveness, and then we move on. He cleanses at all times. We are we are have that avail, uh, the availability to be made right before God and have his forgiveness. So he goes on and says this, With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself as shrewd. And so to whatever kind of person is there, God is always in a bright and a perfect way going to meet that person where they are. And notice that the, the first three that are mentioned here, with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. I think of the Beatitudes with that. Blessed are the merciful because they will receive mercy. Thinking in those lines like that. And with the blameless, you will show yourself blameless. If they're walking in a place of, of doing things right, you can never bring an accusation against them. Certainly, God will at all times be one who you could never bring an accusation against him. And with the pure, you will show yourself the same way. To the pure, they will see your purity. And really, it kind of is a reciprocal thing. Anything that is good that comes from us is because we've first seen it in him. And as I've said earlier, he's the author of it. But the last one is a negative. With the devious, you will show yourself to be shrewd. So you're not going to be... You're not going to be um, uh, suckered in by those people. They've got their devious plans and all the rest of it. You're going to be shrewd. You could never uh, be taken by surprise is a good way of, of looking at it this way. And here's why. For you will save the humble people, but you will bring down the haughty looks, which we get from, uh, that's the that's the pridefulness and the, the I'm better than you kind of thing that the, the book of Proverbs talks about. And it says, you will light my lamp, for you will light my lamp, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Now that's going to have a reminiscence of uh, Psalm 119 where he says that it's your word that is a lamp to my feet and it's a light to my path. So when David says this, that the, the idea that God makes him aware or illuminates things to him is simply because God has made it aware. It's, it's lit up before his path. So it says, um, for who is God... Oh, I'm sorry. As, as for God, uh, his way is perfect and the word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all of those who trust in him. And I, I realize I skipped a couple of verses. I also am looking at the time and I think at, at this place, there is so much really, really important content. I don't want to rush through this to try to get through the rest of it. Um, and really, I have, a, I have a capacity on uh, how much the um, the editing of these studies once it reaches a certain size it doesn't uh, the computer won't let me uh, make it any bigger so with that being said I think what I want to do I'm going to go ahead and stop here I'm looking at what I've got left in front of me I didn't get as far as I had planned on so um, I think what we will do is I want to pick back up at verse 28 next week because this idea of the illumination, and I think we should take a look at, at how Jesus refers to himself so we can make a good New Testament uh, application to it. So let's go ahead and end at verse 27. For you will save the humble people, but you will bring down the haughty looks, those people who are self-assured and the, the, the self-promotion of it. So we'll stop at verse 27. We're going to pick up at verse 28 because it runs for uh, another, uh, it's, it goes to verse 50 in uh, Psalm 18. And there's a lot of really, really good stuff in here. So let's preserve that for next week. We'll pick up there. Um, feel free to contact me. if I, I know I went through a lot of text today. If there's anything that we've covered here that you think I'd like more detail on that, 
Contact us through the ministry's website, which is oldpaththeology.net. And when you come to the website, you'll see that there is a Contact Us page. And if you just click on that link, it opens up a, um, an email. And uh, you can send us an email through that, and we can, uh, we can um, answer anything. That email comes directly to me, and I'd love to be able to give any further definition on this. Uh, any further detail if you need it. I'd like to make sure that, that none of this goes without being fully understood. So we'll pick up at verse 28 next week, and um, and then we'll get on to chapter 19 or, or Psalm 19, one of my very, very favorites. Uh, we'll get there. We'll keep moving through this at a pretty decent pace because they're all about the, the size that we've been dealing with, and we should be able to get through them. You know, not, I don't want to speed through it, but we can get through anywhere from three to four a week at this current pace with given the size of the Psalms. So with that being said, um, we'll conclude there for this week and look forward to picking up at verse 28 next week.